In this lecture, we survey various groups within Judaism and also Jewish doctrine. We'll start with five early groups, five groups which existed in ancient times, and specifically during the Roman period, which we discussed in our previous lecture. The first group is the Sadducees. This group was wealthy, aristocratic, and somewhat liberal or revisionary. They were also very Hellenized, very influenced by Greek culture and interested in disseminating the values of Greek culture. Most of the priests were Sadducees, and they were politically very powerful during the Roman period. This was a legacy of the 100-year-long Hasmonean kingdom, as we discussed before. When I say that they were somewhat revisionary, I mean that they didn't believe in certain things that a lot of other Jews did believe in. So they did not believe in angels. They did not believe in the doctrine of resurrection. That is, that someday God will raise everyone from the dead bodily, then to judge them on the basis of their deeds. They didn't believe in predestination, and they didn't go for messianic hopes, belief that God would send a special Messiah to initiate an age of peace and to restore the kingdom to Israel. The Sadducees' focus was on the temple services, specifically the temple sacrifices. This party controlled the temple and so this was the base of their power and influence in Jewish culture. And when the temple was destroyed, the Sadducees were destroyed. There was nothing for them to do. Their opponents were the more conservative Pharisees. These were very serious, very pious Jews. They paid attention to oral tradition. They had a doctrine of oral tradition, that Moses had received not only the written law, but also an oral law that had been passed down through a chain of teachers, including them, they did have messianic hopes, and they did believe in resurrection. It seems that most of the scribes were Pharisees, the scholars who copied and learned about the law. They were intensely law-focused. They were interested in interpreting and applying the law. And they always took a conservative approach. They did what they called building a fence around the law. This is coming up with a system of rules that keep you from even getting close to breaking the law. For instance, the law of Moses forbids harvesting on the Sabbath. The Pharisees forbid walking through a field on the Sabbath. Why? Because your sandal might catch on to a plant, and you might thereby accidentally harvest a little bit of grain. Their critics would say they erred on the side of strictness, but they didn't see it that way. By the time of the Roman occupation, the teachers among the Pharisees were being called rabbis, and the word rabbi just means teacher. Prior to this, there had been no such special class of people in Judaism. And the rabbis belonged to various schools of interpretation following various influential figures. So, for instance, two of the influential schools during the Roman era were Hillel and Shammai. And by the way, we should mention that a lot of what we know about the Sadducees and Pharisees comes from the New Testament, that is, comes from the Christian part of the Bible that was written in the first century common era. The third ancient group are the Herodians. These were a party that supported the Roman government of Palestine. They get little mention in the New Testament, and very little is known about them. Fourth group are the Essenes. These Jews lived in a monastic commune, separated from the rest of society. They practiced nonviolence. And what they mainly did was await the end of the age. They were intensely messianic. They expected that things would soon be set aright by God through this special agent. From the Essenes, only in the 20th century, we discovered what is called the Dead Sea Scrolls in a place called Qumran. This is a collection of writings that was stored or hidden away by Essenes. The Essenes believed that they were the only remaining true Israelites. The Essenes believed that the Pharisees and Sadducees were corrupt, that they had compromised with wider society and not been faithful to God. The last group are the Zealots, you could say they're as much a nationalistic group as they are a religious group. Their aim was to overthrow the Romans, so as to bring about an independent Jewish state. They engaged in what we now call terrorism against both the Romans and against collaborating Jews, leading up to the war that ended in 70 CE, when they were defeated by the Romans and the temple was destroyed. The Zealots basically came to an end with the mass suicide at Masada in the year 73, when the Romans were closing in on them, they killed themselves, some 956 of them. And that seems to have been the end of the Zealots. Modern Judaism has evolved almost entirely from the Pharisees. 
The Pharisees were the last ones standing after the Romans twice crushed Jewish revolts. The rabbis reoriented Judaism from temple worship to keeping the law. There was a shift in the main focus. And the rabbis were the custodians of the law. They were the experts in the law, the people who studied the law and commented upon it. All subsequent rabbis can be thought of as the spiritual heirs of the ancient Pharisees. This big shift is referred to as the rise of rabbinic Judaism, a type of Judaism which is headed by rabbis and which is focused, consequently, on study of the law and keeping the law. Let's talk then about three groups of Jews that arose in the Middle Ages. The first is the Karaites. Their name means literally readers of scriptures, and they were founded sometime before the year 770 Common Era, and they especially grew in, in the 9th to 12th centuries. They considered themselves heirs to the true Jewish tradition by way of the Sadducees. What made them so different from rabbinic Jews were that they only believed in the Bible. They did not accept the authority of the Talmud, and they rejected the Talmud. They referred to the Talmud as a spurious invention of the rabbis. At their greatest extent, they had communities stretching from North Africa all the way over to Babylon, and they were widely known for their biblical scholarship. For various reasons, they were in decline by the 1500s. And today there are just a few pockets left of them. There are perhaps 7,000 of them that live in modern Israel. The second medieval group are the Kabbalists. This is a mystical and occultic wing of Judaism. There are hints of some secret doctrines and interest in mysticism in the Talmud, and there are a few mystical writings that may be as old as the 100s common era. But Kabbalism seems to have largely entered Europe in the 9th and 10th centuries. One old book is the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation, which may be as old as the 2nd century. All Kabbalism is based on a cult that is hidden or deep interpretations of the Bible. Often these teachings are considered too powerful to be publicly proclaimed, so they're secretly passed on. This tradition is also centrally concerned with magic, that is, with gaining some kind of supernatural powers by means of knowing God's secret names or by using magical numbers. It's also concerned with angels and demons, with the supposed mechanisms of God's creation, and to an extent with ethics. Initially, it was regarded with skepticism by the rabbinic mainstream, though as time went on, it became incorporated within the mainstream to some extent. Perhaps the most famous book of Kabbalism is the Zohar. This purports to be a book from the second century, but according to his wife, it was written by Moses de Leon, who died in 1305 just before the year 1300 in Granada, Spain. This came to be a sort of Bible of medieval mysticism, and it was integrated into mainstream Jewish culture by around the 16th century. The history of Judaism and Christianity is pockmarked by the occurrence of pseudepigraphal writings, writings which aren't really written by who they say they're written by. This is the only case I know of where the forger is busted out by his own wife. One group that accepted the Zohar as an important text was the Sabbatean movement. This was founded by a man named Sabbatai Zevi, who is a Sephardic Jewish rabbi who claimed to be the Messiah. This generated quite a lot of excitement, but it came to a bad end. At the age of 40, in 1666, he was forced to convert to Islam by the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed IV. Interestingly enough, this didn't kill the movement right away, although it is fully dead now. A third group, founded in what we would call the early modern era, but was still in the Jewish communities, still kind of continuous with the Middle Ages, was the Hasidic movement. This word comes from the word Hasid, which means pious. It was founded by the Kabbalist and mystic Baal Shem Tov, also called Besht. His born name was Israel ben Eleazar, and he was born in Ukraine, active in Poland. Baal Shem Tov was famed as a miracle worker and a healer, he was regarded as a true saint and as a mystic, someone who experienced God in unusual ways. Historian Solomon Nagosian says that, in contrast to Kabbalic mysticism, quote, Hasidic mysticism became a vital, singing faith of the masses, end quote, promoting, quote, contentment coupled with meekness and modesty, end quote. It was an emotional movement. They were encouraged to view all of life as worship. It wasn't dryly intellectual, but featured singing and dancing, the kind of experiences and values that ordinary people could live by. Negosian says that this movement, quote, transformed the face of East European Jewry in the 18th and 19th centuries, end quote. 
Historians say that by around the year 1800, perhaps half of Eastern European Jews were Hasidic Jews. And this was despite some opposition by more conservative rabbis who considered it antinomian, that is, kind of lawless. A central feature of Hasidic Judaism has always been devotion to an inspired righteous leader. In recent times, this man has been called the Rebbe. Because of his spiritual experiences, a Rebbe is a superior spiritual being. God's grace is supposed to flow through the Rebbe to the community. The way to get close to God is to imitate the Rebbe and to unconditionally obey him. And many such were believed to have powers of healing and predicting the future. The Holocaust of World War II wiped out most of Hasidic Jewry. However, there are several small branches of Hasidism that survive today, mainly in Israel and in the U.S. The one Americans are most familiar with is called the Lubavitch Movement, often referred to in the media as ultra-Orthodox or fundamentalist, which aren't very good descriptive names. This is based in New York City, and we'll look a bit more at it in the final lecture. In our next segment, The Biggest Modern Divisions of Judaism.